Let's get into E&M discussion. <clears throat> I think uh, the sheet that you're going to want the most as we go through this is actually the very last um, peach colored uh, piece of paper at the end of this PowerPoint. Is that a, a big Excel document with all kinds of numbers and stuff? I think that's the one that you're going to want, the big Excel document uh, that's at the end of this. I recently uh, had the opportunity to participate in an audit that targeted podiatrists 99203s. Everybody know that one? And use that one, 99203s? Podiatrists 99203s and 74% failed. 74% failed. They were missing something, or in other cases, some things. They were missing stuff such that they did not meet the thresholds of performance and or documentation to meet the criteria for what needs to be there for a 99203. So that's why we're doing this. And my goal in this topic is that 40 to 45 minutes from now, you know exactly what you need to do and document to meet the necessary levels of these ENM codes. There is zero subjectivity to determining your ENM level. No subjectivity. There is no such thing as, well, that felt like a 99203. There's no such thing as all my new ingrowns get a 99202, or all my new fasciitis get whatever. No such thing. Every component of this can be objectively quantified with no subjectivity. And again, the goal is that when you see somebody on Monday morning, you know the exact level with no subjectivity. As a means of introduction, I think everybody in the room knows this. Every time you see a patient, there is a diagnosis code and a treatment code. That treatment that you provide is either an ENM or a procedure. And ENM is when you do just that, evaluate the problem and manage it by making a recommendation. Like a plantar fasciitis patient that you write a prescription for and tell them to wear inserts or give them stretching exercises and prescribe an anti-inflammatory. That's an ENM. That's what we're talking about. A procedure is when you do something to somebody, cut something, incise something, drain something. Like I said, I think everybody's got that. We are focusing on evaluation and management codes, E and, A-N-D, M. I say that because I've seen E-N as in Nancy, M. There's no such thing as that. This is not E-N-M, right? These are E and M codes. And if you look at your grid, the last page of that uh, peach colored handout, you'll see the grid. And if you look along the left-hand column, I hope you'll agree that those are the codes that we use the majority of the time. It's not all of them. I couldn't fit them all on there. So home visits aren't there. Hospice visits aren't there. But the big ones for us are there, office, hospital, nursing home. And as you look at that list, you see new office, established office, new hospital, established hospital, and so on. So as we are going to pick the code that we use, the first question that you need to ask is the easiest one, where did this take place? And you can see there are office codes, hospital codes, nursing home codes. If you go to that half a day a week hospital outpatient department wound center, your place of service, the list of numbers that Dr. Ward gave you at the end of the last PowerPoint, your place of service is hospital outpatient. Your ENM code is an office code, even though you're at the wound center. Your ENM code comes from the office code list. Once you've determined where you are, then you need to determine if you're in the office, were they new or established, versus hospital or nursing home, were they initial or established. Notice on your sheet, those words are different, and that is with intent. So let's talk about office first. They are new if it is somebody that you or someone of the same specialty in your practice has never seen before anywhere or has not seen in three years. You or someone of the same specialty, another podiatrist, 
in your practice has never seen anywhere before or has not seen in the last three years. That makes them new. For hospital or nursing home, the word changes. The word isn't new. The word is initial. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is, it is the first time you see them during that encounter. Sorry, during that admission. Initial, hospital or nursing home, first time you see them during that admission. It doesn't matter if you know them, don't know them, saw them last week, saw them five years ago. First time you see them during that stay, it's initial. And that's the difference between new for office versus initial for hospital or nursing home. So let's go through some examples and make sure we're cool on this. You saw somebody for plantar fasciitis. They got an injection, they got orthotics, and they got better and they disappeared. Now they come back two years later. You haven't seen this person in two years. Their fasciitis is great, they love their orthotics, they have no problem with that, but now they have a wart. First time you've ever seen them for this wart. It's been two years since you were in the off they were in the office. You e &M their wart. Is that new or established? Est you guys killed that. Established. Now, you see a patient in your office today. You do an E&M on them today. The following week, one week later, you need to admit them to the hospital. You admit them to the hospital. You just saw them last week in your office. The hospital admission is that initial or establish. Initial first visit that admission. You guys are on this. Ah, oh, we're gonna keep going because these, these do get more challenging, I think. This one gets people messed up. So you have hospital privileges, you get consulted to see somebody in the hospital. You don't know this person. You've never seen them before, they've never been to your office before. You follow them in the hospital. You do not do a procedure, so they're not in any global and they get discharged from the hospital. Now they come to follow up in your office next week. The, this is the first time they've ever been in your office. You followed them in the hospital, one week later they come to follow up in your office. The first time they've ever been in your office is that new or established. It's established because you or someone of the same specialty in your practice has seen them somewhere in the last three years. You just saw them in the hospital last week. Because you've seen them somewhere in the last three years, even though it's the first time in your office, they are known to you, it's an established visit because you saw them in the hospital last week. Somebody gets discharged today, they go home, they get readmitted two days later. You readmit them two days later. Two days later is that initial or established. It's initial first visit that admission. Now you also may see on that sheet consultation codes. Medicare does not recognize consultation codes. Office or hospital do not ever submit a consultation code to Medicare. It will not pay. Consultation codes do not exist in Medicare world. You'll get nothing. Do not submit consultation codes to Medicare regardless of place of service. Yes, we call it a consult. I got called to the hospital for a consult. That's our language. But if it's Medicare, do not submit the consult codes. They won't pay. <clears throat> In the office setting, what does define a consult for non-Medicare payers? All of the other payers do recognize consult codes. So it is important to recognize for non-Medicare payers, what is a consult? We as specialists and lots of other specialists make the mistake many times of thinking if they were sent from another doctor, that makes it a consult. And that is wrong. Just because they were sent from another provider does not make it a consult. In order for it to be a consult, they have to have been sent from another doctor, and then you render your opinion or advice and then send them back, which I think is the minority of the cases for us as podiatrists. 
in order for it to be a consult, I'm repeating myself, they have to have been sent by another doctor, you render your opinion advice, and then send them back to where they came from. That's a consult. I see tons of notes that say, PCP saw them for heel pain, they referred them to us, and they code it as a consult. And that's wrong, because we keep that heel pain. So we'll, we'll go faster here, because I think you guys get this. First example there is, PCP sees the patient with heel pain, they send them to us. We don't say, you have plantar fasciitis, you should go back and get an injection from your PCP. We keep them. We don't send them anywhere, that's our baby now. Injection orthotics, so that is not a consult. Now we'll try to trick you. I'm trying to trick you, so see if you can catch it. Friend of yours is a podiatrist in the same town. They tell a family of a teenager that she should have a subtalar arthroeresis. And the family is not sure about this, and they're feeling a little funny about this procedure. And they go to a community event, and at that community event, a friend of theirs says, you should go see my friend, you, the other podiatrist, and get a second opinion. And you, as the second opinion, say, I totally agree, I would do the same thing, you should go back to your podiatrist and get that done. Is that a consult? Why not? Not a doctor. It's not a consult because they were sent to you by the friend at the community event. If the same situation happened where the doctor that suggested the arthroresis sent them to you, and you said, yeah, do that, go get that done by her, that would be a consult. So now if you look at your sheet, we have determined where we are, and we've determined if it's new versus established for office or initial versus established for hospital nursing home, and all that's left to do is to determine the level within that thick uh, uh, box, right, within the thick color there. That's what's left to do. And we are now gonna talk about how you determine the level. How you do not determine the level is some of the things that are written here. Like, that person kept me in there forever. I'm doing a higher level. Or they asked a ton of questions. I'm going a higher level on that. Or that person's a pain. That is not how you determine it. You objectively quantify every single thing you did in there, and that's what we're gonna get into next. You had a question? Yeah, yeah. I don't like these people. <laughs> Here comes more bad information. Oh, that's true. Okay, so doctor said, um, if, a, if a nurse practitioner in the practice saw them before, but it's your first time seeing them, they're established, that's true because just like we said the modifier is tied to the group, so is this. The nurse practitioner is in your group. If somebody in the group saw them, they are established to you if they are of the same specialty. If they are of the same specialty, so I take it back, that's wrong. It has to be somebody of the same specialty in your group. And I always give the example of somebody in a multi-specialty group where an orthopedic surgeon saw them, because this happens a lot, and then they send them to you as a podiatrist in the same group, because you're a different specialty, they're new, so I disagree with them again. The nurse practitioner is of a, sorry, it took me a while to get there. The nurse practitioner is of a different specialty. They are new to you, even though it's the same group, because you are of a different specialty. Doctor. The question is, does it depend on who the nurse practitioner is working under? It, yeah, right. So now this comes down, now this is a state thing, right? Whether the nurse practitioner can act uh, autonomously or not, right? So if they can, now they're doing their own thing. If they cannot, now it's tied to the doctor. And if it is tied to the doctor, then it depends on if the doctor is of the same specialty or not. So now we get into the levels, right? Looking on the left-hand side. We have location and new versus established or initial 
versus established. And if you look across the top of that Excel document, the top of that sheet, you see the three key elements of evaluation and management coding. And the three key elements are history, exam, decision making. The time value at the very last column is an exception. It's a different deal, and we're going to talk about on the, that on the very last slide of the presentation. You make your decision, for the most part, based on the three key elements of e &M coding. If they are new or initial, you need to have met the requirements of all three, history, exam, decision making. If you look at the established codes, you see in parentheses two out of three, which means you need to have met the thresholds for two out of the three key elements. So you can have history and exam without the decision making or history and decision making without having met the exam threshold if they're established. So new or initial, you need all three straight across the whole thing. If they are established, you only need two out of the three. So now let's break down these three key elements. History, you can see has multiple components to it. And if you look at the sheet, you see HPI with a bunch of numbers in it. You actually quantify the bullets of HPI that you perform and document. So 99203, what is it, a four? So four points of history of present illness. Nature, location, duration, onset, character, right? Soriki pain, plantar medial heel, first step out of bed in the morning, present for three months. You got four. So you count up. When somebody comes to audit your E&Ms, this is what they do. They count this stuff. So that's HPI, that's easy. The next one is past medical, social, and family history that you perform and document. You count how many of them are in there. It needs to be in the progress note. It needs to be in the SOAP note. If they filled it out and it's scanned into some other part of the chart, that doesn't count. If they filled it out and that gets incorporated into your progress note, it does count. It has to be in your note. And then we come to what is the most commonly messed up aspect of evaluation and management coding and why the majority of those 74% failed their 99203 audits. And that is the review of systems. This is very commonly confused and not done properly. The review of systems is a subjective, that's the key term, a subjective questioning of a patient's systems. And if you look at the bottom left part or central left part of that handout, you see 10 systems listed there. Constitutional, musculoskeletal, dermatologic, and so on. Those are systems that you can choose to review. An example of a system review, if you look at constitutional, is have you experienced any recent nausea, vomiting, fever, chills, weakness, or fatigue? And if they say no, 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 and you document patient denies any recent nausea, vomiting, fever, chills, weakness, fatigue, you have performed one, <clears throat> one review of system. Everything that you do in e &M coding is dependent upon what you do, what you document, and what was medically necessary. Look at the very, very, very top of that page. Medical necessity is an umbrella that governs all of this. You could do it. You could document it. But if you can't argue that it was medically necessary, they don't want to pay you for it. And you should not take credit for it. So the systems that you choose to review and document and claim credit for should be pertinent to that visit and should be medically necessary. The questions that you ask, the systems that you choose to review should be pertinent and medically necessary based on that encounter. 99203 requires two systems be reviewed. 99204, I'm gonna pick on. 99204 requires that you perform, document, 
and have had it have been medically necessary, 10 systems. 10 systems. Look at that list. 99204, you need to be able, you need to have performed and documented and argue and defend the fact that it was necessary. 10 systems. And where people get into trouble is with electronic health record templates and you pull up your new fasciitis template that the EHR vendor gave you, and there are 10 systems already reviewed and filled out for you. Patient denies all this stuff, and the provider says, cool, I got 10, it's done. Well, if you didn't actually ask them, that's bad, but even worse is if the fact that they had blood in their stool or not doesn't impact your care, you shouldn't be claiming credit for it. Asking about burning on urination, frequency, how many times do you have to get up in the night to pee, may not impact the decisions you make about their fungal toenails. <clears throat> 10 systems for 99204, so be careful. Now, there is no rule written anywhere that says podiatrists can't do 99204s. It is my opinion based on what I just shared, that it is extraordinarily rare, my opinion, that it would be appropriate for a podiatrist to have the medical necessity to review 10 systems. And somebody agrees with me. Novitas, which is the Medicare contractor in Maryland and part of Virginia and many of the states that you guys practice in, Novitas has a prepayment audit, that's rare, prepayment audit, on pod podiatric 99204s. So if a podiatrist sends a 99204 to Novitas, they want the note before they write a check. So somebody there is thinking along the same lines. So the systems are subjective. So here's, he, it should not say, review of systems, heal pain. That's a chief complaint. It should not say, what my residents like to do, review of systems, CHPI. That's not a review of systems. It should say, Chief complaint, heel pain. History of present illness, sore pain, first step out of the morning, present for three months. Review of systems, musculoskeletal colon, aside from their heel pain, patient denies any other weakness, stiffness, achiness, limitation of motion. That's one. I do constitutional for almost all of my new patients, because you could argue that constitutional symptoms can kind of go along with almost anything we see, right? It's weird nail and skin things can happen following somebody being ill. People can get post-viral flares if something hurts. Nerve stuff can be weird after somebody's been ill. So just about every single one for me is either constitutional and derm, or constitutional, the constitutional and derm if it's a skin or nail thing, Constitutional and musculoskeletal if it's fasciitis or a broken something or something that hurts. And constitutional and neuro if it's like neuroma or tarsal tunnel. And those are really the only combos that I use. Sometimes the three of those. That is my opinion on doing 10. It's subjective. You have to write that whole thing out. You can't say constitutional denies. You can't say constitutional N.A. I gave you what's there for a reason. It has to say constitutional, and if they actually do deny it, if they say, yes, I've had fever, of course, you put positive, positive fever, you know, fever symptoms, but if they say no to everything, you have to write that all out, and then you have reviewed a system. In order to have the, met the threshold for the history, you need all three, HPI, the past medical, uh, uh, social, and family, and the review of systems. Next is exam. If you look at the bottom right hand corner of the handout, you see a bunch of exam bullets. A bullet is anything that is preceded by a Microsoft Word bullet, little black dot, right? That's a bullet. And as you look down the sheet, you could see it jumps from one, six, or 12 bullets. You count up the bullets. Many of these, if you do them bilaterally, it counts as two bullets. So you can count up all those bullets and see how many bullets of exam did you do. If you do on a new patient what we learned in school as a good thorough lower extremity physical, vascular neuro orthoderm, it comes out to like 14 to 16 bullets. So you're good for 99203. 
Look at 99204 again, please. And you will see that in order to do a 99204 for the exam section, you need to have examined an entire organ system, the whole organ system. These are the organ systems from which you can choose. And every single one of these, except musculoskeletal, in my opinion, has something that completely eliminates it as an option for us. There's otoscope, ophthalmoscope, heart sounds, lung sounds, and all kinds of stuff in all of these other ones, except maybe, maybe musculoskeletal. And what you see on your sheet is yes, all the individual bullets that you can count up, but what is in that whole big thick box constitutes the entire musculoskeletal organ system. So to have examined the entire organ system, you would need every single bullet listed there. And if you look carefully, you will see bilateral upper extremity skin inspection, two arms, bilateral upper extremity range of motion and muscle strength. So it is my opinion that is either never or very rarely appropriate for a podiatrist to do all of those things to arms. It's an either never or rarely deal. And then we come to decision making. And if you look at the options, it's straightforward, low complex, moderate complex, right? Now that sounds like there may actually be some subjectivity now. But if you go all the way to the bottom, there's the decision making grid. Now this starts to get a little weird. But if you want to do it right, this is how to do it. This is going to get a little hairy. I'll go slow. You see the options listed on the bottom. And on the left hand side, we abbreviated low comp or straightforward SF, LC for low complex and so on. And then going across from those levels of decision making are the three sub-components of decision making. Differential diagnoses and treatment options, data that you order or review, and then risk. Those are the three subcategories. To meet the level of decision making that you're trying to get to, you need to have two out of the three of those sub-components. So to have low complex LC, to have low complex decision making, you need to have met the thresholds for two out of the three of differential diagnoses, treatment options, data, and risk. If you don't have the risk level, but you got the other two, you're fine because you only need two out of the three. Now, it still looks like there's some subjectivity there because it says moderate, low, right? Th those, those different weird options, but you can actually quantify this also. You're gonna need a pen if you're still hanging in there with me. So let's look at differential diagnoses and treatment options. These thresholds actually have number values. Nobody gets this right. So there's 40 podiatrists sitting here. You can be among the only 40 in the country that know how to do this properly and pass any audit that walks into your office, which you want to do. So if you're still hanging in there with this, what I suggest is on your sheet, write down these numbers next to each corresponding thing. And it's easy because it's just one, two, three, four, down the four. Now, how do you know what your number is? How do you know if it's a one, two, three, or four? It depends on the problem or problems that you evaluate. If you evaluated and managed a improving problem only, that gets you a one in this column. If it is a follow-up tinea pedis person that you had given a topical product to use two weeks ago and they're all better and you say, that's great, it's all better, use it for another week and then stop and let me know if it comes back, you have evaluated an improving problem, you get a one. If it is a new problem with no additional workup planned, new patient with an ingrown, you take it out and send them off, you get a three in this column. If <clears throat> the follow-up tinea person who was doing great and you said we don't have to do anything more with the tinea had a new ingrown that needed to be removed, you get a one for the improving tinea and a three for the new problem that didn't require additional workup, you get a four in this category. So that's how you determine 
where you are in that column. Not too bad, right? Now we move to the next column, data that you order or review. <clears throat> Same deal, one, two, three, four, for the four different options. One, two, three, four. How do you quantify? I said that we were gonna objectively determine all of this, <clears throat> what number you got. If you order a test, it's a one. If you order three tests or labs, it's a three. If you review someone else's result, if you review a hemoglobin A1C that a lab sent you, if you review an MRI report, each of those get you a one. If you order an A1C and review an MRI report, one plus one gets you a two in this category. If you perform your own review, like look at an x-ray yourself, that's a two. If you look at an x-ray and you look through MRI images on the disc yourself, two plus two gets you four. So you add this stuff up and that's how you get the value in that column. And then finally we have risk. How do you know what level risk you have? Now we're all the way at the bottom right of that grid. And you, you have to read through these. If you have any of the things that are listed here, it's minimal. And then the easiest one to me is the very first thing. One self-limiting or minor problem gets you minimal. You can read through these. Two minor or one chronic gets you low. And I'm not gonna take the time to read all these bullets. You can read them yourself. I just wanna pause at one. I'm trying to hit the mistakes that we hear a lot. Under moderate risk, one of the options is prescription drug management. You write a prescription. I don't know how this happened, but I hear it all over the country, all the time. If you write a prescription, that automatically gets you a 99214. No, it doesn't. The only thing writing a prescription does is get you moderate risk which is one of the three things you need to determine your decision making, which is one of the three key elements of e &M coding. So just writing a prescription gets you moderate risk only. So there's no such thing as writing a prescription automatically gets you a certain level e &M. I hear it a lot. I just wanted to express that. Those are the three key elements. And I would suggest that the majority of the time you should be basing your decision of e &M code based on the three key elements. There is an exception to the rule. And it is what I like to call the greater than 50% rule. Now we can look at those minutes that are all the way on the right hand side of that grid. If you make your decision based on the three key elements of decision making, the minutes mean nothing. If you bang out a 99203 in 12 minutes based on the three key elements, you're fine. Where the exception comes in is if you spend, you can see that each code has a minute value all the way to the right. If you spend that many minutes with the patient and greater than 50% of that time was spent in counseling and coordinating, then you can choose that code even if you are deficient in one or more of the three key elements of e &M coding. So now let's go back to 99204 that we picked on. What's the number, 50, 45? 45. So if you have a patient in the office and you legitimately spend 50 minutes with that patient, 26 or more of those minutes were spent in counseling and coordinating. Now you can use 99204. You have to spend a total of that much time. 50% or more of that time has to be in direct counseling and coordinating. If it's in the office, it has to be face-to-face -face time. You have to be in the room looking at them. If you leave the patient room and go to your doctor room and call their PCP, that doesn't count. Not fair, in my opinion, but it doesn't. If you're in the hospital or nursing home, time on the floor or unit out of the patient's room does count. So in the hospital, 
inpatient, if you leave their room and go to the nursing station and call the infectious disease specialist to discuss the culture results and call the hospitalist to talk about the surgery you're planning for tomorrow, that time does count. If you're going to choose your code based on this greater than 50% rule, you should document the total number of minutes you spent, how many minutes were spent in counseling and coordinating, and what you spent so much time talking about. If you're gonna say that I was with them for 50 minutes and 30 of it was in counseling and coordinating, you should document what all that time was spent doing. I built a template for this. This time was spent discussing their new diagnosis, explaining it to them, discussing the different treatment options that exist, including a discussion of the potential advantage and disadvantages of each of these options, answering their questions, stuff we do, right? I, I made a template for that. You may choose to do the same. So if you're gonna go this route, document in minutes with a number, how many total minutes, how many minutes were in face-to-face, -face, and what all that counseling and coordinating was about. Be careful, you're gonna laugh, but I've seen it. Don't claim to have spent 60 minutes with 10 people during an eight hour workday. I've seen it. Thanks for your attention. Questions on E&M coding? Yes, please. Yes, I agree. Doctor said, so if you look at 992, doctor said, does it, based on what you're saying, if we had do an initial hospital encounter, should it really only be 99221? I think so. Because if you look at 99222, it really, I think with one column, is the same exact threshold as 99204. So in order to do a 99222, you need to have performed and documented 10 review of systems and have them be medically necessary. Now my hospital has an H&P form. We're not EHR yet, believe it or not. We're still paper charts at my archaic institution. And there is an H&P form, it's like 10 pages long. And they have a review of systems thing. And they do, for example, constitutional. Nausea, vomiting, fever, chills, weakness, fatigue, and you can very easily go check, 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 and you could bang out 11 review of systems in 20 seconds. You have to have done it, and it has to be medically necessary. You better be able to answer them if they say to you, why did you need to know whether they have burning on urination? If you can answer it for all 10, great, you're fine, but you better be able to answer it. Yes. Every single initial hospital in my practice is 99221. I've never used a 222 in my career for that reason and the full organ system. I don't care about the range of motion of their arms. Maybe I'm not being a thorough doctor, but it doesn't matter to me. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Doctor said, uh, patient's in for a cardiovascular problem and you get consulted for an ingrown toenail, which one do you use? Well, it depends. It depends on what you do and what you document. I would think that you're never getting to a 99222 and it's probably going to be a 99221. Because Medicare does not recognize consultation codes, you're stuck in that initial hospital visit category, which is why I said 99221. Because Medicare doesn't recognize consult codes, and the lowest level we have is 99221, which is pretty high thresholds, they have told us, Medicare has said, if you do an initial hospital encounter and you don't reach the thresholds of 99221, you can use established hospital even if it was your initial encounter with that patient during that admission because the thresholds are lower. 
Doctor said 99251 and 252 should never be used for Medicare. You won't get paid. Correct. Those are consult codes. Never send them into Medicare. Yep. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay, so the comment was, you're in an HOPD, and it's one of these nationally run centers, I go there too, and they make them, these poor nurses do five million things and back you up because they have to ask them 5,000 questions and family history things that we don't care about. But, they, yeah, and a good review of systems, right? And the nurse takes 45 minutes to get through all this. Can you do a 99204? The problem is it has to be you. If the nurse is doing it and you're in the hallway on your phone waiting for the nurse to get done, no good. It has to be you and your time face to face. If you're sitting there listening to it and that nurse is doing it on your behalf and you're in the room, yes, you can count that time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So the question was, if the nurse documents it and I sign off on it, can I do the 99204? It still has to be medically necessary. So if they're reviewing 10 systems because Heologic's suit in Massachusetts told them they had to, that's very nice. But in order for you to code for it, you need to be able to defend the fact that it was medically necessary, which I think is tough for 10 Blood in the stool, burning on urination, chest pain, right? I mean, maybe chest pain for some of our stuff, infection stuff. But 10 is a lot. you got to find 10 on there that you can say were, it was necessary for me to do that in order for me to provide the care that I provided that day. There's no rule that says you can't, but you need to be able to defend it. I'm just sharing my opinion. Dr. Ward, how do you feel about this medically necessary business and 10 review of systems? Right. All right, so for those on video, Dr. Ward said, agreed, 10 is pretty difficult to get to.